In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. A few days ago, I was sitting in one of the county jails talking with Nathan, whose name you may have seen on the prayer list in the bulletin. Nathan and I had been talking for about 40 minutes, and he told me that he had been sober for 240 days, the longest period of time he's been sober since he was seven years old, and he's 24 now. Nathan has been reading Leviticus. That's right, despite the title of Father Kraft's last book, may he rest in Texas, Nathan was reading Leviticus. As we were discussing the difficulties of Leviticus, the lights went out, and it was very, very dark. Now, I've been visiting in jails for 25 years, and I've been kept out because of lockdowns. I've been kept in because of lockdowns. I've been told my clothes are the wrong color. I've been kept out because of power outages, but I've never been inside when there was a powder outage, so I didn't know what to do. Nathan is handcuffed to the table where we're sitting, and he's locked inside his side of the room. He can't see anything at all, and he starts to be a little bit freaked out. I can see through the one-way glass behind Nathan into what's known as the bubble, where the deputies watch inmates and open doors for me to come and go. In a few minutes, a deputy with the flashlight comes by and asks if we're okay. I assume he's going to escort me out, but he tells me I can stay if I want. They don't know how long the power will be off. I haven't asked Nathan for prayer requests that I couldn't see to write them down anyway, so I asked the deputy to come back in 15 minutes. As time passed, I could see more and more of the bubble as my eyes adjusted to the darkness. Because it was one-way glass, I usually just see myself and what's behind me. But the longer I looked, the more I could see. The lights came back on in about 10 minutes, and I was able to see to write down Nathan's prayer requests and then to spend about an hour with Stephen, whose name is also on the prayer list in your bulletin. Take your bulletins home, please, and pray for that list. In the dark, we can't see what's there and what's missing. And there's something missing in our Old Testament reading today. You can tell just by looking in your bulletin. Verse 6 to 12a of 2 Samuel chapter 6 are missing. We heard about the ark of God being moved. Then we hear about King David dancing before the Lord as the ark is returned. But what happens in verses 6 to 12a? Well, first, a little bit of backstory on the ark. This is the ark of the covenant, not Noah's ark. And it is the ark that Indiana Jones was looking for in Raiders of the Lost Ark. The command of God to make the ark is found in Exodus 25 with a complete description, but it's basically a gold box that the Jewish priests, the Levites, carried around. Much like our tabernacle, the presence of God dwelt in the ark. God commands not just how to build it, but who may come near it. Everyone was aware of these commands. They were not a secret. The ark traveled with the armies of God through the book of Joshua, and the people of God often recognized their military victories because of God's presence. In 1 Samuel 4, however, there's a battle with the Philistines that kills 30,000 Israelites, and the ark of God is stolen. It is passed among Israel's enemies for many years, and many enemies of God die because they do do not give the ark or God the respect that God demands. Today's Old Testament reading picks up 33 chapters later. David is now king. We hear from David almost every day when we read the Psalms, but we don't get to read about King David that often. Today, David's army has recaptured the ark, and they are bringing it back to Jerusalem, the holy city. We read today that David gathers 30,000 men, the same number that were killed when the ark was taken, and they build a new cart. Two men, Uzzah and Ahio, are driving the cart. Verse 5 tells us, David and all the house of Israel were making merry before the Lord with all their might, with songs and lyres and harps and tambourines and castanets and cymbals. The lectionary then jumps to verse 12b, and all of a sudden we find ourselves at the house of Obed-Edom. People seem much more reverent of the ark, starting things off with a sacrifice before dancing and celebrating again. They dance all the way to Bethlehem, where David's wife sees the dancing and despises David because of it. And that's a story I wish the lectionary had left out. 
This second set of dancing, in fact, comes three months after the castanets and cymbals of verse 5. Uzzah and Aheo, who were driving the cart, are not mentioned at all. What happened to them? Well, Uzzah is dead. The oxen had stumbled, and Uzzah put out his hand to steady the ark. Verse 7 tells us, God smote him there because he put forth his hand to the ark, and he died there because beside the ark of God. King David is angry with God and takes the ark to Obed-Edom, a Gittite. And did you get that? The king of Israel takes the presence of God to a foreigner and leaves it there for three months. Uzzah is struck dead, not because he had purposely set forth to disobey God. I'm sure he thought he was doing a good deed. David is angry, but the celebration of the ark continues with dancing just three months later. How can they celebrate a God who strikes people dead? And this is not the first time God had punished people who thought they were honoring God. In 1 Samuel 15, Saul is removed as king of Israel because he chose to save some animals for sacrifice when the Lord had commanded that those animals be destroyed. Samuel responds to Saul in this way. Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. We've also seen it in Joshua 7, where 24 soldiers die in the first battle of Ai because a man named Achan had broken faith. And if we spend any time reading through the Hebrew Scriptures, we see this as a pattern, not as an exception. As Christians, we tend to wave away this kind of thing by saying, oh, that's the Old Testament, or they were under the Old Covenant. And those things are true, but when we say that, we're forgetting or ignoring a very important thing about God. God never changes. And that's one attribute of God that only the unthinking want to ignore. There are probably many things we'd change about God if we had the chance. Indeed, much of the world, even much of the church, acts as if God is malleable as silly putty. But if he is, we're all in much bigger trouble than we can imagine. But back to these injustices we think we see in the Old Testament. And that's what they are, right, to us, injustices. In this area, the Hebrew people, who only had the promise of a Savior, not a flesh-and-blood Savior like we do, the Hebrew people consistently described God in this way. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. That phrase is found in Exodus 34, Nehemiah 9, Joel 2, Jonah 4, and Psalms 86, 103, and 145 in those exact words, and it's all over the place in not-so-exact words. And three months after Uzzah dies, King David is dancing so intensely that his wife is offended. And David probably composed today's psalm, Psalm 24, in memory of this occasion. People have died and David dances. And he writes, Who can ascend the hill of the Lord? And who can stand in his holy place? Those who have clean hands and a pure heart, who have not pledged themselves to falsehood, nor sworn by what is a fraud. The Israelites are taken captive by the Babylonians for 70 years, and yet Nehemiah can still say, The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. A hundred years after the kingdom of Saul, David and Solomon splits in two, the prophet Joel can still say, The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. More injustice happens, and God's people still say, The Lord is merciful and gracious slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. But not today, right? When I get a hangnail, I'm convinced it's an injustice. And what about you? Are there any injustices in your life that cause you to question the goodness of God? And this brings us to our gospel reading. And something is missing from our gospel reading too, isn't it? Yes, I know what you're all thinking. It's the head of John the Baptist that's missing in today's gospel. Once again, that's true, but I'm looking for something else. We've all been taught that the word gospel means good news, right? But where is the good news here? I suppose it's good news for Herodias. She gets what she wants, but not really. The law that John had been quoting to Herod, 
it is not lawful for to you to have your brother's wife, that's not John's law, that's God's law. Herodias is now guilty not just of adultery, but of murder, and she's brought her dancing daughter in on it. As always, there's plenty of guilt to go around when humans are involved. And it's not really good news for Herod either. Herod feared John. Our text reads, Herod feared John knowing that he was a righteous and holy man and kept him safe. When he heard him, he was much perplexed, and yet he heard him gladly. Beheading a righteous and holy man could hardly have made Herod's day. And we learn something else about Herod here, don't we? Herod believes in the resurrection of the dead. He thinks that Jesus is John raised from the dead. Yes, this adulterous, murderous king believes something that most of the world today, and even some who call themselves Christians today, flatly deny, that God can raise someone from the dead. So where is the good news? Where is the gospel in this story? Like things in the dark, we have to look carefully and let our eyes adjust. Jesus' name had become known. Some said John the baptizer has been raised from the dead. That is why these powers are at work in him. But others said it is Elijah, and others said it is a prophet, like one of the prophets of old. I know what you're thinking. That's it? That's the good news? Well, yes, it is, because John the Baptist has been beheaded. That means John the Baptist is not the expected Messiah. Jesus is the expected Messiah, and by extension, Jesus is not Elijah, nor a prophet like the old days. As John himself says in the Gospel of John, chapter 1, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me, for he was before me. He said that before he was beheaded. Jesus is the Word made flesh, not just another prophet, not just another example of a man who lived a self-sacrificing life. Yes, our Lord Jesus is the one King David mentions in today's psalm. He is the one with clean hands and a pure heart. He is the King of glory, the Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. He too is the one who is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. And we can't see that, that just by looking, right? We have to let our eyes adjust and keep looking at it. And we see many injustices in today's world, don't we? We see the guilty go free, and we see the innocent go to prison. And when we see these injustices, do we think that God is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love? Or do we think of God at all? Did John the Baptist deserve to die? Did Uzzah deserve to die? I don't think so. My problem is that I think I understand justice better than God understands justice. How about you? I think that I've got a better handle on things than the one who is, by definition, just. And that is the plight of those of us who are sinners. Yes, God is just, and we see his justice most clearly and profoundly at the cross. There, God himself, our Lord Jesus Christ, took our sin upon himself that we too might have clean hands and a pure heart. We too can ascend the hill of the Lord. The church commemorates the beheading of John the Baptist every year on August 29th. Orthodox priest Father Anthony Hughes said this in his sermon in 2010. Today we remember John's martyrdom as an end, but also as a beginning. Endings do not close doors, they open doors. John finished his course just as the public ministry of Jesus began. There was no more need for a forerunner. The Messiah had come. A little later, Father Hughes, like many Orthodox priests, stops preaching and starts meddling. He says, if our spiritual practice is not leading us to a deepening and daily transformation from the inside out, then it is weak and ineffectual. If so, it is a sign that we have missed the message of the gospel and must be open to seeing anew what we thought we understood. The spiritual life is a continual movement from death to life, from darkness to light, from turmoil to peace. There is a path from sin and the misery it causes that's available to us, but it is a road that demands our all. We are not called by the Lord to simply give all that we have, but to give all that we are. What seems to be missing these days? It's not a few uncomfortable verses. It's not the head of John the Baptist. In fact, nothing is missing. It's there in the gospel. Have we missed the gospel? It is revealed to us in the scripture and the breaking of bread. 
When we come to Christ, as we do every time we come to the altar, we find great reason to sing and dance. As God was present in the ark, so God is with us. And he is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen.